Good morning and welcome everyone to our worship this morning. We are gathered here to worship our great God on this long weekend, uh, 4th of July weekend. And it looks like many people are traveling, but we're here. And I'm glad, I'm so glad you're here to worship God together. So uh, I'm going to invite all of us to uh, stand and uh, read together the verses from Psalm 103 as our call to worship. And uh, I'll be reading a section uh, with Peter, and then uh, you will uh, join me. Uh, we'll, we'll be reading responsibly as God calls us to worship together. Right? Okay, let's, uh, let's read this together. Let's start by putting uh, our songs. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, bless his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Bless the Lord, all His heavenly hosts, and you and His servants who do His will. Bless the Lord, all His works, everywhere in His dominion. Bless the Lord, all His servants. That is the God that we worship this morning, who is so great in His love and mercy and faithfulness, and we have more than actually 10,000 reasons to praise our God and worship Him together. So let's bless the Lord together with a song by singing. Bless the Lord, my soul.
everyone in this world, no matter where people come from, no matter how kind, what kind of sin that anyone has committed, we thank you, Lord, that you have a big heart, heart big enough to embrace anyone and everyone in this world. We thank you that you are a God who invites us every day and on this Lord's day to come to you and worship you. And God, we pray that as we spend this hour or so here together, that you, by your Holy Spirit, will come upon us in such a way that our hearts will be so open, so humble, so amazed at your grace and your faithfulness, that we will be filled with gratefulness and with joy and with strength that only come from you, and that you will flood us with your peace, Lord. Your peace to uh, rule our hearts and rule our lives and rule this world. And so we ask Lord, that you would be truly honored and pleased and worshipped by your people. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people say it. Amen. We're going to continue to worship and uh, I'm going to read one more psalm. The, the last psalm of the uh, in the Psalms, one, uh, Psalm 150, where the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary, praise Him in His mighty heavens, praise Him for His acts of power, praise Him for His surpassing greatness. And, you know, it's, it feels to me when I read that, you know, there are so many reasons why we should praise God every day. Uh, and then the psalmist is so compelled to say, like, you know, if there's any instrument out there, bring them all in and praise God. And so he starts to praise Him with sounding of the trumpet, and he goes on with, you know, uh, naming different instruments, and he says, praise Him with a clash of cymbals, praise Him with resounding cymbals, and that everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So uh, this morning, I'm going to uh, need your participation, everybody, whether you're musical or not. And we got a bunch of uh, percussion instruments here, and we don't have a drum set today, and you got to be all drummer today. Is that going to work? Can you help me with that? So uh, there are probably like 30 people can come and uh, pick up the, like their shaker, their uh, tambourine, so don't be shy, just come up. Uh, young and old, I mean, we don't have a lot of kids, but all the kids come up, all the big kids come up. <laughs> yeah, come on, please, uh, grab something and then you can go back to your seat. Uh, and then we'll tell you how this is going to work. If you don't have an instrument, then your, your hands will be your instrument, all right? Clap, and then and your, your voice, all right? So, two each. All right? Oh, that's thank you, Deb. All right, so take all of them. We don't want anything. Make sure the kids have uh, the instruments to be there. Logan, alright? So, uh, are there a couple more? Somebody can take the bongo. Uh, you can, you can, you can. <laughs> this is how the instrument's going to go. So, if you have that sticks, then this is how it's going to go. Yeah, yeah. You can make a shot. Thank you. 
Uh, and then uh, pray for our inner life, uh, our relationship with God, our faith, uh, what goes on inside. And then we're going to also, uh, thirdly, pray for our neighbors and our city. So uh, those are the three things we're going to pray for. And uh, I'm going to read a passage, and uh, that's going to give us some thoughts about each one of those uh, prayer topics. And uh, we'll, we'll give you about a minute. And, uh, you know, that silence may be, uh, too, you know, feel like too long, because we're not used to silence together. But in the silence, uh, think about something that God brings to your mind, and pray for something about those three things. And if you can't think of anything to pray about, then ask God to give you something to pray about. And the Holy Spirit will give you something. And if there's a word, or a person's face, or anything that comes to your mind, and uh, just talk to God uh, about that uh, as uh, God leads you, alright? So that's how we're going to pray together. So first we're going to pray for uh, family, our family, your families, and our church family. And then uh, after uh, the prayer, then uh, Al's going to close the time with prayer, and then I'll begin the second prayer. So the first, uh, praying for our family, the Ephesians chapter 6, 18 says this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this special day that we call Sunday. A day that you gave to us many years ago when you created this world. When you told us that you worked seven days and you took a day off. We thank you for that blessing. And then we thank you for the New Testament, Lord. When our Savior Jesus Christ suffered and died at death the cross. And then he arose from the dead. And then he said, we took the first day of the week off to come and celebrate all of this that we received from our Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you will keep one of us up today with new strength for your day, that we might be able to come here and ask for your blessing. What a privilege it is that we could come and worship you in this country without even fear of anybody entering the doors here. We thank you for that gift. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of healing that you give to so many. We thank you for the healing and the gift that you gave to Frank Potter. We pray that you will continue to strengthen her. We pray that you will be with her tomorrow as she again is hoping to go back to Old Crest and be water for her. But we just pray that you continue to bless Frank and give her peace of mind as she goes through this transition and then in her life. She's already 93 years old and she still loves you so. We also want to pray, Lord, for the, for the Tacoma family. We pray for their daughters, Diane and Linda. We pray that you will be with the Bobby Sutton family, Linda and Gary. We pray that you will bless them as they go through the death of their father. We know, Lord, I've known God for so many years. He is a person that loves the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. He is a person that has always been a witness for you. And now he has made that transition. He has met the Lord and Savior face to face. And what a glorious day that was for God. We pray, Lord, that you'll be as a family that is left behind. We know that they will grieve, but they grieve differently. They are, we're not grieving for Bob anymore. He's with Jesus. We kind of grieve for ourselves because we miss a loved one. And if we didn't miss a loved one, that means we didn't love them at all. But we love them dearly. And we pray that you just continue to bless this family. We also want to pray, Lord, for many other people in the church that have many different problems. We know, Lord, that we pray for Judy's uh, granddaughter. We pray that you touch her body, heal her. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that 
healing might come and his cancer might be relieved from her. We also want to thank the Lord for Rick Carter, a man that comes to our dinners quite often and puts them on the church. We had shield. We pray Heavenly Father that you will just bless him and touch his body and heal him and give him peace of mind as he goes through these things. I also want to pray, Lord, for the stops. They had many things that they walk slow and they can't do the things they used to they do when they were young. We pray that you will bless Chris and Marcia, give them amazing strength. We thank you for the love they have for the church and the love they have for you, that they just enjoy coming here each week, and we thank you for that. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless the whole family as they went through this tragedy, but they too know that their sons are in heaven with Jesus, and uh, that's the most wonderful thing. But we know, Lord, no one left behind for you. And we just pray that you will give them all peace of mind as they come to you in prayer. We pray that they will be able to leave, leave these things at your feet and continue on in life. Okay. Uh, we continue to pray uh, for our inner life, and we don't often pray for our uh, inner self. And this is modeled by uh, Paul in, in the Bible, how uh, Paul prays for the church. And so I'll read uh, these passages from uh, Ephesians 3, 14 through 17. And if there's anything that also in this uh, scripture verse that uh, gives you a nudge uh, or idea to pray for yourself, your inner life, uh, we'll, we'll do that. So let's continue to pray with this. Uh, the Bible says, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Dear Father, we thank you for the faith that you give us, faith to trust you, faith to know you, faith to take steps of um, risks sometimes to follow you. And Lord, I pray for any one of us in uh, this morning in our congregation, Lord, who may feel really weak on the inside today, who may need the strengthening power of your spirit. I pray, God, that you will strengthen us with your power. Lord, we confess uh, that in our hearts, uh, Paul prayed for Christ to dwell always, but there are other things that dwell in our hearts, our ambitions, uh, idols that we create, uh, even sin that enters in and we don't know what to do with. Uh, we ask God that he would cleanse us this morning by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. That you would forgive us, that you would have give us the heart of repentance and the courage and the faith to say that we will uh, lead those uh, things that uh, do not please you, but we will follow you, Jesus. So we pray, God, that you will give us a uh, refreshed heart this morning, uh, that you would give us uh, a heart that really desires to follow you, and anything, Lord, that blocks and becomes barrier between us and God. We pray that the power of your spirit that you remove that right now as we pray. So Lord, strengthen us in our faith and increase our faith, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing we're going to pray uh, about is uh, praying for our neighbors and our uh, cities. And this is what Jeremiah 29, 7 says. And seek 
And this is God saying to uh, the Israelites in, in captivity in Babylon, and uh, to God's people God saying in that foreign land where they're captives, and seek the peace and prosperity of the city, which is Babylon, to which you have, I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So let's pray for uh, the neighbors, uh, where neighborhoods where we live. If anyone that you know of that uh, comes to your mind, pray for them. Pray for anything that goes on in our city, in our neighborhoods, that, that need God's intervention. But also uh, give thanks to the Lord for anything that comes uh, to your mind about your neighborhoods or the neighbors or in your cities. Right? So we'll pray for that for a minute, and then I'll try and close that prayer. Let's pray again. Father God, we lift up our city here in Wyoming. We're thankful for our leaders as they govern and make decisions. Give them wisdom and guidance. And we think of our neighbors around us here in our little corner of Wyoming, and, uh, wherever we live. And if anyone's like me, uh, we have great days and we have bad days. And we just pray that you would uh, meet people where they are, that your spirit would move in people's lives, that they uh, would be. Uh, be able to feel your presence in our life as a beloved child of God. And help us uh, be neighbors uh, wherever we might live, or either right around here or just nearby, uh, as a, a light in our neighborhood, that we might be people who have a heart and eyes and ears to, to see people as you do, and listen and uh, be a, a, a presence uh, for your kingdom now in our neighborhood. And so it's and all these prayers that we lift up, prayers for our cities and our neighborhood. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, announcement time. We've got a couple of those this morning. The first one to say here, we kind of uh, kicked this off last week. There's information, uh, papers on the back table there. Uh, so if, if you've heard anything about that before, having a meal with somebody, uh, just connecting with people, Mark and I sort of put those together, and then call you, and uh, there's a leader who will call you at least and set it up. So find out more about that. There's a yellow paper, I believe it is, right back there. So the next slide is the same thing, but vision art. So again, I'm not going to get into too much of this today. This is coming. This is not an immediate thing, but it's been something that I've wanted to do, and I would love a lot of interaction with and just support uh, more people who... <coughs> want to contribute to something really cool, I think, in the end. Um, so that's just vision art for, for later that maybe you just need to hear again. Um, connection cards are in front of you. Our offering will go by in just a moment. But um, if you're visiting with us for the first time today or the 100th time, fill that out. There's prayer requests on the back that you can share and have that prayed for specifically and privately. Or also, we can put it out on email uh, to the church. And you can fill out if you'd like to be connected with stuff like that and get an email on. There's a little box there that you can fill that out as well. And then the National Night Out is coming up August 1, which it's, I know we're at the beginning of July, but um, Vince um, Frampton is coordinating all that. It's going to be a sweet night, but he would love volunteers to sign up as soon as possible just to know what's needed and what other kind of people we need to tap on the shoulder to help with. Uh, so think about that or just show up the day out. It would be awesome. And then also, uh, two weeks from now, the 16th, Sunday the 16th, if, if you are interested in joining Calvary or wonder what membership with Calvary even looks like, uh, Mark and I, Pastor Mark and I, are going to be uh, kind of holding a little class uh, just to get that rolling, and I'm looking forward to it. We've got a lot of fun things to talk about. Maybe you've got a ton of questions if you're recently, past six months, 
just sort of been hanging out. Uh, doesn't matter when I guess you join, but show up if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Even if you are a member, we'll talk about some cool things. And uh, I think even uh, hear some cool stories as well. And uh, I think that's all I have to say. And I'm going to introduce the offering now as well. We are in a new month, and so our ministry of the month is for Save Haven Ministries. And in your bulletin on the back, there's a little um, description of what Save Haven does. We've talked about them a little bit. In short, it is a ministry for women who need to, uh, I guess, have a resource to get out of an abuse situation, all sorts of things. That, uh, they offer resources and supports. Uh, great ministry, they're local and nearby. Uh, we love working with them and talking with them and, and helping them out. So that's our ministry of the month. I just want to say thanks for last month, Young Life. I'll get the number for you um, probably in an email this week or we'll publish it next week. But uh, Young Life is probably over $1,000 for the ministry here and, and starting in Wyoming at the middle, uh, middle school and the high school. So a huge thanks. I know that they're going to be incredible, thankful, incredibly thankful for that. Um, but now we're in a new month and Safe Haven uh, gets our love. So uh, our offering will not be received. Thanks.
sounded more profound when I was practicing it than, uh, <laughs> than it did just a moment ago. But uh, Pastor Mark and Marsha are elsewhere this weekend, and so just earlier this past week, Pastor Mark asked if I would step in for him. My name is Ron Meyer, and a little bit of an introduction to bulletin today. Let me say just a word about that. Uh, we have been attending Calvary Church, my wife Jill and I, since about December, so about seven months, and uh, we're almost members. Uh, what does that mean to be almost a member? Kind of like almost pregnant? <laughs> we're almost members. That is, the council, I believe, has received our membership. Uh, we haven't been public about it yet. That's scheduled for two weeks from today. So we are almost members. I am ordained in the Christian Reformed Church, was ordained 41 years ago in 1976. That's the bicentennial of our great nation, right? 1976. I've served five churches over that period of 40 years, three of them here in Michigan, beginning in Michigan, ending in the last 20 years in Michigan, serving a church in New York and serving a church in Indiana as well. Now I'm retired. We live about four miles from here and have really enjoyed our first year of retirement. So I've been asked to go to pulpit this morning. Um, I assumed that this privilege opportunity would come along maybe sooner or later as we join this church. I just didn't think it would come this soon before we're members. <laughs> and only almost a member. So maybe I'm almost preaching in the church. <laughs> Thankful for the opportunity, Thankful that Mark honored me by asking to this place. The last number of years in active ministry, I would always preach a summer series of messages. And I chose to preach on some nature themes. So one summer, I preach on bird stories in the Bible. You're looking kind of blank. Maybe more about that some other time. Animal stories in the Bible. Water stories in the Bible. Tree stories. And running out of the nature of themes, I've preached a summer series on a number of stories, stories about numbers and stories about clothing. Now that all sounds a little strange when I just announce it like that, but it was a very exciting series for me at least, and uh, it just uh, kind of filled that gap between Pentecost and Thanksgiving, kind of no man's land, somewhat throughout the church year. And it just challenged me to get into scripture in a different sort of way, a special sort of way, taking one thought from scripture and sort of running with that for the entire summer. A couple of years ago, I did that series on trees, tree stories. Now, I know that sounds strange, but if you think about it, and I encourage you to think about that later today, uh, you will begin to think of many, many stories, or many, many references in scripture to trees, and how that interrelates for our lives. One of those special stories of the Bible is found in Daniel chapter 4. I invite you all to open your Bibles and follow along as I read from the book of Daniel chapter 4. It's a rather lengthy chapter. We can read it in its entirety this morning, 37 verses, which doesn't sound all that long. It's a little longer, it seems, in 37 verses. Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream about a tree. And so this is obviously very interesting uh, tree story in Scripture. Daniel chapter 4, it's found on page 926 of the Bible that I have in my hand, and perhaps in your Bible as well, 926. One thing this really emphasizes is the sovereignty of God over kings and kingdoms. And so it's appropriate to try it on this 4th of July weekend to think about God's sovereignty over kings and kingdoms. Daniel chapter 4, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. And this is Nebuchadnezzar talking, by the way, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, even though this is found in the book of Daniel, these are Nebuchadnezzar's words. Nebuchadnezzar's telling of this story, of his dream. <laughs> how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom, his dominion endures from generation to generation. I. Nebuchadnezzar was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise of the valley be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. 
when the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy God is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me. These provisions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree, large and strong, its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the beast of the field found shelter. The birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked. There before me was a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree! Trim off its branches! Strip off its leaves! Scatter its fruit! Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal, till seven times pass by before him. The decision is announced by messengers, the holy ones declare the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and gives them to anyone who wishes, and sets them over, the, over them the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I can never desert have. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means. None of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air, you Okay, are that true? You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. You, okay, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with the fruits means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O King, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed, it may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips. The voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that 
The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about that was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heavens because everything he does is right. And all his ways are just. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Look once again at verse 32. Back to verse 32, please. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone who wishes. Pardon me, needs to feel what we will apologize for the length of the scripture passage. On the other hand, how can one receive too much scripture? It can't be done. Your Christian friends, it's a classic, a classic. It's at least a children's classic, seems to me, what it is. Well, what the sermon title suggests, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast is a classic. Many of those who've seen it once wants to see it again. Many want to see it over and over on both the screen and the stage. Beauty and the Beast. Now, this tree story in Daniel 4 is another classic, seems to me. It happens to be about a beautiful tree, and the kingdom becomes a beast. Beauty and the beast. More than that, of course, but at least those two things. A beautiful tree and a king who became a beast. This morning, I'm calling this a Fourth of July classic as well, since the story of a king that Nebuchadnezzar contains such a timeless lesson for all nations, right? God is sovereign. Sovereign over all kings, all nations, at all times. It took King Nebuchadnezzar seven years to learn that lesson. This morning we're going to spend just slightly over seven minutes to relearn that same lesson. I think it's safe to say that the theme of the entire book of Daniel is that God is sovereign. Sovereign. From the exile itself, the nation of Israel taken away from the nation of Babylon, to the privileged status of Daniel. First as a young man there in the king's court, later as an older man in the lion's den, to the miraculous episode of Daniel's three friends in the fiery furnace, including, of course, those dreams that we find in the book of Daniel, as well as the handwriting on the wall that Daniel was able to interpret because God had given him the special ability there in the king's court. The entire book of Daniel really is saturated with this theme of God's sovereignty. Heaven rules, it says in verse 26. And verse 32 adds, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Oh, that leaders of all nations of the world today realize the same timeless truth. Or at least the leaders of our land. God blessed America with this realization that God was sovereign. It still seems like yesterday. I was only 17, living for just five months in Nigeria. My parents were missionaries there for a short time. And so I was living in a boarding school in Joss. My roommate, his name was Paul, who everybody called Turk, because his last name was Turkstra. Turk was writing his senior term paper about dreams. Dreams. He would wake up in the middle of the night, we were roommates, and so I was aware of him waking up in the middle of the night, in order to write down the dreams that he had just dreamed. So that he could remember them in the morning. In an attempt to make sense out of his dreams, he would write them down, which I'm sure, I think he really never made sense of his dreams. Do you? 
I mean, do you dream? Do you know what your dreams mean? Do you remember your dreams? Probably not, unless you like to wake up and write them down, like my friend Turk did. Most of us don't remember our dreams, and it's just as well. Right? Few of them, if any of them, are significant. They don't really mean anything, or they might reveal something about our fears or anxieties, or maybe something, whatever's on mind, troubling us, or whatever. Uh, we might dream about, but by and large, our dreams don't mean a hell of beings. There were times, though, in biblical history especially, when God communicated to mankind through dreams. Jacob dreamed about that ladder, staircase from earth to heaven. Joseph dreamed those prophetic dreams about sheaves and stars. New Testament Joseph was born in the dream to flee to Egypt along with Mary and baby Jesus. Rather unusual, though, were those times when God chose to reveal something in a dream to a pagan king. There was a Pharaoh of Egypt who was given those prophetic dreams that Joseph interpreted, dreams about cows and corn. And then there's two of these dreams, the book of Daniel, that God gave this pagan king with that long Babylonian name, Nebuchadnezzar, a dream that was incredibly prophetic. It was as if God was saying, let me tell you how the next few years of human history will unfold. Now in this case, what God had to say about the unfolding of human history was quite personal. It only or primarily referred to Nebuchadnezzar. It was his history, or rather his future, that God chose to reveal. It's more about God's sovereignty and about God's people as such, but it's a lesson for God's people, even if it didn't seem to directly concern them at that point in time. It was a lesson for God's people to remember once they returned from exile in their own land. God is sovereign over all, all the time. Over every nation, theirs, ours, every nation. Now God chose in this scripture lesson to reveal his plan and his sovereignty to the most powerful person in the entire world at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of this vast and powerful Babylonian empire, the dominant world power of that time. God chose to teach him a lesson. To humble him. To humble this proud king. To reduce his area of influence to a small swatch of grass. Where he would live like a beast. For seven years. To keep him in that humble state until he learned the lesson. Until he learned that he was not the most powerful being in the entire world. Until he acknowledged the Lord. And gave God the glory. He had come to do this. God used a tree. God used a tree about a tree. It was a huge tree. It was old, strong, tall, reaching to heaven, put in verse 11. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, beasts of the field lived under its shade, birds nested in its branches, and many were fed, it said, from it. It was magnificent beauty. It was a magnificent, beautiful tree. Until someone came along, Chopped it down, cutting off its branches, stripping off its leaves, scattering its fruit, burning off the beasts and birds, leaving only the stump. Stump. Now, what a dream that was. And Nebuchadnezzar knew it. He knew that the dream was significant and meaningful. That's why he commanded all his wise men to immediately come and give him an interpretation. It also seems that he knew the dream was ominous, that it had some sort of a dark meaning associated with it. And this may explain why he didn't run to Daniel, first of all, because he wasn't all that eager to know what he meant. But we now know it was clear and consistent with the theme of the book of Daniel. God is sovereign. Sovereign over all the nations, always has been, always will be. God is in control, even when it doesn't seem to appear so. It says in Proverbs 21, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. This sentence caught my attention in one of my commentaries. It goes like this. A man who thinks he is like a god must become a beast to learn that he's only a man. I'll repeat that. A, god, a man who thinks he is like a god must become a beast to learn that he is only a man. In the case of Nebuchadnezzar, 
God gave a dream to get that blessing across. Can we think of other world leaders? We should dream similar dreams like this about trees instead of dreaming about what they can do with all the power that they think exists in their own hands. This unusual dream called for an interpretation. But just like in the case of Nebuchadnezzar's earlier dream in chapter 2 about the great statue that represented four succeeding empires, Nebuchadnezzar first consulted his own wise men who may have been useful to Nebuchadnezzar in the past, but who were seen unanimously clueless, in this case, in understanding the things of God. All, after all of their efforts proved useless, Daniel appears. Fortunately, Nebuchadnezzar remembered Daniel. Then Nebuchadnezzar states in verse 9, I know that the Spirit of the Holy God is in you, and no secrets trouble you. Explain to me the dream and its interpretation. And he proceeds to tell Daniel his dream, all of that beautiful tree, and the beast, beauty and the beast, and how the tree was so magnificent and tall and strong, but unfortunately cut down, and how nothing was left of the stump. Suddenly, although it may seem rather subtle, there is this dramatic shift in this dream. I don't know if you notice that as we're reading through it. It becomes him. It becomes him. Speaking of the stump in verse 15, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and verse 15 continues, and let him graze the beast on the grass of the field. If the stump becomes him the king. What's going on? If the stump becomes him the king. Verse 16, let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the beast, the heart of the beast, and let seven times pass over him. In the telling of this story, there's still another dramatic shift. As Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream about this tree, Daniel states in verse 20 to 22, the tree that you saw is you, okay? The tree that was tall, strong, and seen by all the earth that was cut down by only the stuff remaining is you, Nebuchadnezzar. Your dream is about you. God is telling you what's in store for you. The dream is very personal. The interpretation is even more so. The tree is you. Many of you are familiar with the time in the life of David, King David, when the prophet Nathan came to David after David committed the adultery with Bathsheba. Nathan told him the parable of a rich man, a poor man, and a poor man's only lamb. After Nathan told David that the rich man stole the poor man's lamb to feed his guests, and David declares that the rich man was guilty, guilty, Nathan said those infamous words, You are the man. You the man. You are the man. You the man. Nebuchadnezzar, that tree is you. In both of these cases, the kings had failed, both Nebuchadnezzar and David. The kings had failed to submit to the laws and the sovereign will of God Almighty. And so God intervened, in one case using a prophet and a parable, in this case using Daniel and a dream. The tree is you. God notices. God notices and responds, is involved in the failures of world rulers, and he does not sit by and wait at their failures. In some cases, he will go to great lengths to humble the proud, like in this case. And in more recent times, and maybe even these days. When the so-called most powerful leaders in the world today flaunt the right of a sovereign God to overrule them or to govern through them, sooner or later, God will get involved. The tree of you. Okay, sooner or later, God will reveal his sign as he has done throughout his history, time and time again. Now, not to overdo the dramatic shifts in this story, but we have to add another one. In the middle of the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel adds two things. Being a beast will be temporary, he suggests, and leaving the stump contains a promise. Verse 25, you will be like a beast for seven years till you know or learn that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. 
verse 26, the stump remains, which means your kingdom shall be restored to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Being a beast is temporary, leaving the stump contains a promise. If or when Nebuchadnezzar learned the lesson that God wanted to learn that day, he could be king again, restored to his throne, with his kingdom restored to him. A man who thinks he is a god must become a beast in order to learn that he's only a man. God is in the renewal business, amen? He's in the business of renewing the whole world, and he loves to renew human hearts, including and especially the hearts of world leaders. He's in the renewal business, renewing the whole creation. we pray these days for our nation's leaders. Let us be sure that we are also allowing God to renew our own hearts. There's a break between verse 27 and 28, which is also another dramatic shift in the story. Probably the most important one. It's a year later. Verse 29 says, at the end of 12 months, it's a year later. Verse 28, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 30 suggests that his pride is still unfortunately intact. Just look, Nebuchadnezzar says, how great the city or kingdom of Babylon is that I have built by my mighty power, by the honor of my majesty. Oh, that must have been one extra proud moment, right? Because, whoosh, in an instant, the king is eating grass, along with eating his own words, and as we say, eating humble pie. Verse 31, while the words were still in his mouth, the voice came from heaven, Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom has departed from you. That beautiful tree, Adam, the king, now a beast, wet with dew, eating grass for the next seven years. Question of the morning, who could do that to the most powerful leader of the known world? Answer. Only God. Only God can reduce the most powerful man on earth to the status of a beast in a moment. Only God can remove this Babylonian king from his throne, humble him in an instant, and teach him a lesson that other world leaders should also take note of. Heaven rules. The most high rules in the kingdoms of men. Forgive me, but there's one more dramatic shift in the story that we need to take note of before we conclude. Verse 34, at the end of those seven years, we read, Nebuchadnezzar recalls, I lifted up my eyes to heaven. My understanding returned to me. I came to my senses, he says. Echoes of whom? The prodigal son, perhaps? Remember how he came to his senses? Recall how he remembered his father? Remember his change of heart as he longed to eat what the pigs were eating that day? Recall how that humbling experience both woke him up and called him home? Here, King Nebuchadnezzar reports in verse 36, My reason returned to me. Now I praise and exalt and extol and honor the King of Heavens. Praise God, the purpose of the dream had been fulfilled. God had fulfilled that dream, and the purpose of that dream had been fulfilled in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. He had been humbled, he had learned the lesson that God intended, he had become a beast for seven years, but now, come to his senses. And most importantly, he now recognizes God. Heaven rules, he says. The most high rules over the kingdoms of men. That's the purpose of the dream had been fulfilled. Who would have dreamed that Nebuchadnezzar would have his kingdom restored to him after being a beast for seven years? Who knew that Nebuchadnezzar would be given a second chance? This is the best part of the tree story, right? I mean, it comes at the very end. Nebuchadnezzar lifts up his eyes to heaven and says, I bless the most high praise and honor him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. We're told in the very first verse of this chapter that King Nebuchadnezzar is saying what he learned throughout the seven-year ordeal to his kingdom. 
He, he's speaking to his kingdom, telling them what has happened to him. No, he's speaking to the whole world. Verse 1, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth. Verse 2, I declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Verse 3, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. The dream was fulfilled. The purpose of the dream fulfilled. Now what if? What if other world leaders, what if some of today's world leaders would come to learn the same lesson and know the same God? What if? What if we remain more sure, more sure that heaven rules, that God will fulfill his plan? For this world, and that all things will work together for good, because God is so. He will see to it. That his plans and his purposes for this world will ultimately be fulfilled. Two hundred and forty one years. This fourth of July makes two hundred and forty one years. That's a lot of years, right? That's a lot of ups and downs. Two hundred and forty one years of ups and downs. In fact, many times Christians especially have wondered, where is he? Where is God? Doesn't he rule? Doesn't heaven still rule? Admittedly, it doesn't always seem like that's the case. But stories like this that we looked at again from Daniel chapter 4 this morning remind us that he does. He rules. Heaven rules. God will always rule or overrule in spite of the way it appears sometimes to our human eyes. One nation under God. Some don't believe that. Some would like to eliminate that saying from our coins and from our pledge. But it will always be true, won't it? Under God. One nation under God. Heaven rules or over rules. Let none of us forget what King Nebuchadnezzar would have died. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we're thankful for this special time of the summer season. As we as a nation pause to celebrate our king's liberties, pray for our leaders in a special way as well, for our military, to give thanks, O oh Lord, that you led those early settlers, pioneers, and pilgrims from other shores to this shore and settled this land in spite of its failures, O Lord, in spite of its shortcomings, in spite of its many ways that it falls short. So, O Lord, we pray that we continue to bless. Bless this land, our leaders. Bless us as citizens, O Lord. Continue to lay upon our shoulders and minds a sense of responsibility as citizens, Christian citizens of this free land. Bless us in this holiday weekend, O Lord. May we truly celebrate in a great and good way. And give thanks to you. God of heaven and earth, God who rules the God of Son, Son of all. This we pray in the name of King Jesus. Amen. We transition this morning from talking about earthly kingdoms to talking about another sort of idea of the theme, that heavenly kingdom. Paul writes in the epistles that our citizenship is in heaven. That's different. Well, we're citizens of this land, but we are that too, but we're also citizens of heaven. And so we celebrate a spiritual experience here this morning at the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to read a portion of the forms that's available in our cell for him, and just some select verses to prepare our minds and hearts for this special occasion this morning as well. Beloved to the Lord, hear the words of the Apostle Paul concerning the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us hear also a brief instruction concerning the purpose for which the sacrament was ordained. 
When our Lord said, do this in remembrance of me, he ordained this holy supper as a constant memorial and visible pledge of his death. The Apostle Paul also teaches us that as often as we eat the bread and drink the wine, we proclaim the Lord's death. As we partake of this communion supper, therefore, this morning, we bear witness that our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father into the world, that he took upon himself our flesh and blood, that he bore the wrath of God on the cross for us. The sacrament thus confirms us in God's abiding love and covenant with us. Let us then be persuaded, as we even read this morning, God will always love us and accept us as his children for the sake of his Son. Our Lord promises, moreover, that as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are fed with his crucified body and shed blood. The holy sacrament is also a means of grace that unites us with one another in the bond of the Spirit. Finally, the remembrance of our Lord's death provides in us the hope of his return. Our Lord Jesus will surely do what he has promised, but us draw near to the table then. Believing that he will strengthen us in our faith, unite us in love, and establish us more firmly in the hope of his coming. It's been my experience in the tradition which I have ministered and been raised to recite together the Apostles' Creed on this special occasion. Um, please rise and join in these words that many know. Some will have to read on the screens, but let us make this profession of faith together as we approach the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us together say we part in the moment. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of God and Earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the knowledge of Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us lift them up to God for our salvation. I invite you to join in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Know yourself to be a sinner. Save my grace. Thank you.
special meetings, we hold this piece of bread in our hands, the symbol of Jesus' body. Take, eat, remember, and believe the precious body of the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Wine was used in abundance. At the Bible times, it was the drink of choice. Jesus used that in the upper room as well and instituted the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. He poured out wine for his disciples, gave thanks, and then he sort of changed history forever. And he said, Now this is, this represents my blood. Pour it out. For you do this in remembrance.
faces may never grow old. Behold, these symbols of the blood of our precious Savior Jesus Christ in our hands and now invited to drink. Remember, believe the precious blood of Jesus Christ who poured out the completeness of all our sins. We began the service with Paul's worship of Psalm 103 and include as well from that same psalm, Praise the Lord in my soul, all my inmost being, Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord of my soul and forget all his benefits. Who forgives all my sins. From the book of Revelation, we read, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and praise. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the special occasion, the special part of our service to as we gather around the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Obedience to his command, do this in remembrance of me. We do it not just out of obedience to the Lord, but in faith, believing that the death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago has an incredible significance for us today, July 2017. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going all the way from heaven to earth, all the way from the cradle to the grave and the cross, and for focusing the eyes of our faith on those single events of Jesus' birth, suffering, death, and resurrection to accomplish not only our forgiveness, but the gift of eternal life. Empower us, enable us, fill us with a sense of worship all week long as we carry these thoughts, O Lord, into your world, into our lives, into this week, into this holiday, and throughout this life. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're going to leave this place by saying amen one more time, that God is sovereign as we heard in the message, and that Christ has poured out his, his life, uh, his blood and his body for us, for our sins, for our salvation. And so we're going to say, as all God's people, say amen, right? And so we're going to all stand again, get your instruments out, uh, and before God we're all children, right? So whether you're a seven-year-old or you're a 70-year-old, you know, we're all got children. So make those before God. And we're going to sing this song one more time. And I think you're going to be even better than the first time. Uh, really good. And, you know, really the what to say, you know, the, the aiming for in this, in this song, one thing that really struck me uh, is in the middle of the second verse, actually, where it says, we're all broken. Yeah? Amen? We're all broken. But we're, in this, we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. That's such a relief that God knows that I stumble and fall. But then the, the, the gospel in this song is where you say, uh, where give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. Amen? And that's what we're holding on to. So let's sing this out one more time and all God's people say amen. All right? So get your instrument out. Here we go. One, two, three, four. We are not alone. If you are not alone. If you are not alone. Then you feel our pain. No time to hold you. We are all the same.
find with you is 